Okay, that didn't change it to where I've got a, only a small part of it. Okay, good, that worked. <coughs> Create the illusion that there are a lot of people here. Oh, I see. In these first two, I'm not sure if you did this. I thought I was first off the red column. sound. I know, I'm just, I was just setting something else up up here than my PowerPoint presentation was the one that up. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I couldn't get more. I mean, it's a technical difficulty day. We've got a little beep accompanying us, so just pretend it's EDM and it's real slow. Just bop <laughs> along in your chair. <laughs> it's very slow. Um, so, hello, good morning, every. Uh, welcome to the Arkansas Society of Freethinkers September meetup. Uh, ASF is a nonprofit organization devoted to maintaining the separation between religion and state, advocating a scientific and humanistic viewpoint and improving the lives of non-believers. You can learn more about ASF by picking up one of the flyers back at the table at the back where Chris's daughter is standing, uh, and, or at the, 
uh, website, ArkansasARFreeThinkers.org, or the most reliable way by getting to know somebody here today or an organizer around you. And that's my own voice and echo. Uh, we've got restrooms back here around the wall to the back left if you need to go to the restroom. Uh, our standard disclaimer, ASF is a diverse organization with members who represent a wide range of opinions. Very true. The speakers who present at our big meetings do not necessarily represent the views of ASF or its individual members because we are a 501c3 organization. ASF cannot directly support candidates for public office, but we can advocate for causes such as separation of church and state, scientific literacy, societal progress, and truthful communication. That said, oh, and another thing, um, if you came in, there was a little paper poll, if you didn't see it on our Facebook page, but we have a little poll about which kind of messaging you think sounds most like and would be um, uh, most influential if you were to see, you know, out in town in the form of marketing. Uh, if you'll complete that little survey and just leave it there on the back table, we would appreciate that. And... Um, so that said, I believe our free thought for the day is being brought to us by our esteemed ASF member, Jerry Schultz. So thank you. welcome Jerry to the stage. The free thought of the day is just an opportunity for one of us to get up there and give you a thought of the day. And my thought of the day is that it's very important to be yourself. Don't, don't try to fake it, don't try to be somebody else. No, everybody else is already taken and nobody else will be you, so you need to do it. Please, you know, the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that these days, there's no hiding anything anymore. We're, we're all being monitored constantly. Right now there's a camera on me. Uh, we're, we're, you know, my, my phone is listening to me and probably recording everything I'm saying and sending directly to Bill Gates. So as far as you know, you're, you're not going to have any more privacy. So just go ahead, be yourself, don't try to fake it. You, you can't wear a mask, it's not going to work anymore, just be yourself. And that's my message for today. Thanks, Jerry. Very important information. I think I, I agree. It's, it's been hard, you know, to open up and be myself. I came out of a very religious history of my life, and uh, so I think it's very important. Um, have you ever received an email from a prince offering you a huge sum of money to help him smuggle a huge sum of money out of his country? Have you ever been contacted by a former wealthy person, now a refugee, who again wants your help getting a huge sum of money out of his country? Or maybe you uh, get an email telling you that a wealthy American with the same last name as you has died in an accident, leaving you a huge sum of money at a bank. And he needs someone with the same name to pose as the heir so you can take this huge sum of money and keep the bank from having it to give it all to the government. Or have you been approached by a handsome man or a beautiful woman over the internet who's just looking for a friend or maybe something more, wink wink. Our next attorney, I mean our next speaker, is local attorney Will LaKell, who has seen what can happen when you respond to one of those emails. I believe he'll be here shortly. <laughs> Any second. Um, also, I would like to grieve with everybody and memorialize our sorry, dear friend sorry, Jenny Buffett. Sorry, there was an ambulance and I was busy. Um, Thank you. Thank okay, here is, here's what I just wanted to talk about today, and that is the exciting and fun adventure of scam baiting. I have uh, responded to scammers on the internet and uh, gotten some very interesting, um, very interesting uh, opportunities to see, you know, exactly how this system all works and to play with them. Uh, originally, this all started with 
me just getting these emails and sending silly responses back. And I had a bunch of friends who would, would look at it on the internet, so I would send these silly responses. And you know, here, here's my firm, um, Ron McKellen, <laughs> it's over there, Ron McKellen Hyde. And uh, you know, please remember us if you've ever been in an accident or need to sue somebody, uh, we'll give you the best representation we can. But scammers are out there everywhere these days and you probably get a dozen opportunities to be scammed every day on your phone, on a text, and through the email. Well, the email is kind of, well, I really, that's not where I really started. I really started with telemarketers back in the day when a human being was a telemarketer and you could monkey with them. You know, I told them once, I'm not really the guy you're calling, I'm just, just robbing the house. So, but, uh, uh, you know, that, that has gone the way, by the wayside when you're only talking to a recording. So when a recording says, hi, how are you doing today? And you say, I'm on fire right now. And they say, good, great to hear it. We've got a great bargain for you. <laughs> well, okay. These days, though, the, you can't play with them anymore. They've been taught to immediately hang up. So the ones left are the people who are emailing you. Now, one of these things is called an advanced fee fraud. It's very common, and the thing that really bothers me about these is that it works. There have been a lot of people victimized by these various things. As she mentioned, a prince from far away needs your help. A banker needs someone named Lakel. Gosh, who knows? Here I am, a well-connected person who has hit hard times. A lottery winner wants to give away his winnings. You know, bill collector, someone with a an ex-husband, this is one that happens to lawyers. They get either somebody trying to collect a judgment or somebody trying to collect, you know, on a, on a divorce case, and they give you this too-good-to-be-true story, and I'll tell you about them those in a minute. But the first thing that happened was Chibuzo contacted me, and I, he, this is the kind of thing you see in their, in their um, messages. I'm contacting you, believing you are an honest and trustworthy person. And I responded, you have no basis for such a belief. In fact, I was in charge of dirty tricks for the Nixon administration. <laughs> I believe you will not betray the confidence I have in you to have contacted you, even though we've never met before, he says. And I said, but we met before in a bar in Angola where I was moonlighting as an arms merchant, Chibuzo. Don't you remember? Well, you were rather smashed, weren't you? Anyway, you should know that I will betray your confidence, just like last time when I turned you over to the KGB. Wasn't that fun? And so he says, talking to me about an account, this is, this is the, you know, we've got somebody by your name. The account has a net balance of uh, $28,900,000, uh, so $28.9 million or $28,900,000. The owner of the account was Engineer Lakel B. And so I responded to him, my great uncle Barney left about $28 million in Togo last time he was there, which was about 10 years ago. Uncle Barney isn't deceased, he's just a sound sleeper. Well, you know, I thought that was the last I was ever going to hear from this guy. It's usually the last I ever heard from these guys, but I was wrong. I get an IM from him in a couple of days. He says, please, you have told that you will betray me. And I said, I will, I'm horribly unreliable. This is a text going on. You see the times, don't you remember? And he says, yes, I got your mail and I can see that you can't help me out. And I said, you're Chibuzo and Zama, aren't you? About 50 now, six foot eight, 125 pounds. Yes, is me. That's interesting. I can't trust you. What's wrong? Haven't you figured out I'm making fun of you yet? And he says, You think I am frusted. And I, I am not, I have a job. Okay, I guess frusted means unemployed. But anyway, and then he says, Are a man at all? And I said, I'm a man, I think. And he said, I don't think so. And I said, Oh, you may be right. Some people say I'm a goat. <laughs> Well, the thing about this is this told me that there is no IQ test for becoming a scammer over on the internet. So I started playing with these people and more and more often, the more ridiculous stories I could still play with them and try to disrupt the scam industry. Now I told you about the scams that they play on lawyers like me. I get an email from maybe a potential client, a wronged ex-wife or a businessman who needs a lawyer to collect a debt for him on a contingent fee. And then you say, sure, it looks like a good case, I'll take it. And they immediately, as soon as you've taken it, before you can even put the, the other side on notice, you get this, this immediate offer. Here's the money right here, we'll give it to you, we'll pay you, don't worry about it. Then very shortly after that, the scam scammer contacts the lawyer again. Lawyer deposits the check in a trust fund. 
and then sends the clients his share, takes the rest, and then the check bounces and the bank tells you that wasn't a good check, and they've cleaned out the trust account. Now, the ones that they're talking about here with these giant amounts of money, it really doesn't work because very few lawyers have quite that much in the trust account. But this has worked a lot with smaller amounts. There have been a lot of lawyers that have been taken on this. It, you, you can't believe it, but it really works. So what's the response? The lawyer scam baiter, the fake law firm. The real lawyer gets a scam email and sends it to the scam baiter. The scam baiter responds. Now the scam baiter set up. If you go online, I think it's still there to this day. The Run LaKell and Hyde um, website for the law firm is there, and there are a few other entities that, have, that I've created that are online and usually on cheap or inexpensive or free websites. Um, then they, instead of be just saying, sure, I'll take the case, I send them a contract. And so I still get this fake check. For some reason, these tend to come from Canada. And then the scammer immediately needs his money. So I say, sure, it's in the way. It's in the mail. It's on the way. And then you string them along as, as long as possible until they get frustrated or frustrated. And uh, <laughs> sometimes they don't figure out for a long time that the lawyer is fake and get increasingly desperate. But finally, they will figure it out and go away. Here's an example. This is from a fake matrimonial debt scam. This is a real email that I got. This is a final degree of divorce from somebody named Kimura Zuckenberg. Now, one thing you'll notice is very frequently they'll take wealthy sounding last names, somebody they've heard of that's rich in America, and use that name. And it was very nice of the Japanese court to issue this decree in English. Uh, but um, they, they did. So anyway, I send out a contract. And, and the first, it's t first two pages are actual real legal contracts you know, real, that real lawyers use, and I have them initial everywhere, and then I, I add something like this. Verification of reading and comprehension of contract. In the experience of the attorneys, by the time a client gets through two pages of boilerplate, stops reading, he or she's likely to sign anything and initial anything. This paragraph does absolutely nothing, but we ask you to initial it anyway, just to show you're paying no attention to the legal verbiage you're signing and initialing. Let's face it, that's probably how you got your ass in a sling in the first place. To, if you initial here, you confirm that you have not read the contract, but you're signing it and you're agreeing to be legally bound by it anyway. Okay, now I just keep on. There's a lot of other gibberish here, but the important one is if this is some sort of internet scam and not an actual case to be litigated, client hereby authorizes attorney to publish any and all correspondence, emails, and documents provided by client on the internet as a warning to all other lawyers and to consents to the firm turning client into the proper authorities. Let me tell you, that part never works. They can't do anything about it. You try to call the, the FBI or the, the attorney general, there's nothing they can do, so they don't care. And finally, just to be safe, I have a provision. Client agrees to provide five naked pictures of himself or herself for blackmail purposes. <laughs> now, those of you who may be unfamiliar with the code of professional responsibility that we lawyers have, we're not really allowed to put this in contracts, so if you ever see this in a contract, Beware and certainly don't send the naked pictures. But anyway, fake lawyers are not subject to the ethics codes. This is, I don't know if you can see it from here, but this is basically a, the letter that I get immediately after I accept, yeah, I, I quote, accept one of these claims. This guy is sending me a check for, I think that one's $650,000 and saying, yeah, we'll have the rest of the money to you later with the idea that I'll deposit it. He'll say, I need it right now, and I'll send him his you know, two thirds and I'll keep my third. Okay, that wasn't supposed to go that way. Here's a picture of a real check, the real fake check that I got. It was on the Bank of Nova Scotia, the Banque de Nouvelle Ecosse. Now, interestingly enough, just to make it really look well, they misspell uh, Nova Scotia in French. Um, <coughs> 650,000 bucks, so I ignored. Here's another fake check I got for 297,500, and, and this one also came from Canada. Well, you know, then I just throw these away, put, a, put them to one side and say, um, you know, well, I've got it, and, and, you know, mess with them as long as I possibly can. There's, I could talk about this far longer than any of you want to listen, I can guarantee you, but let me just give you a little bit of a clue what out there, a romance scam. I've got a romance scam featuring a prominent statue of Vladimir Lenin in a small American town. 
Uh, I got one with a, another fake inheritance scam where I in, created entire probate pleadings, uh, fake probate pleadings to send to them, you know, to show that I had actually gotten myself appointed as the administrator of this non-existent person's <laughs> estate. And the best one I ever had, ever, was when I was able to convince a scammer that I was a different scammer and that I had stolen his victim. And I got these terrible letters from the You couldn't believe the emails. Now, it was in, you know, gibberish, and I can't reproduce the gibberish, so I just told them, you know, right in English, you're not fooling anybody. But, you know, they were threatening all of this stuff, thinking obviously that I was right there, you know, in the next neighborhood, uh, and of course, I wasn't. So anyway, if you want to read more of this nonsense, there is a free book out there available on Scribd called Scam Baiting for the Insane that I wrote, and it's got a whole lot of my adventures just like this. I'd like to thank you for listening, and believe me, don't believe it when you get something that's, that's not doesn't sound like it could possibly be true. It's not. So um, just uh, take care of yourselves. And if you ever get something you think is really, really um, fake, then you may want to just play with them just a little bit to see if you can have some fun. Thank you. <laughs>
there is a statistically significant inverse relationship between pirates and global temperature. There is a graph in the letter, you may have seen it, it's pretty compelling. Bobby Henderson concluded, I think we can all look forward to the time when these three theories are given equal time in our science classrooms across the country and eventually the world. One third time for intelligent design, one third time for, for flying spaghetti monsterism, pastafarianism, and one third time for logical conjecture based on overwhelming observable evidence. <laughs> for more on the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster, go to spaghettimonster.org. Pastafarianism is one of the fastest growing faiths in the 21st century. So that's the pirates. There was another phenomenon on the internet. It began in 1995 and has steadily grown. September 19th each year is international, international, talk like a pirate day. It gained traction when Dave Barry promoted the idea in his humor column. Pastafarians adopted the holiday and September 19th became a holiday in the Pastafarian calendar, second only to every Friday. <laughs> <laughs> now to tie all this together, here's Bosun Tubby. All right, let me get a, the right picture of hair because I don't think that's mine. Where do we go? All right. oh, no. See, I'm, well, I, I don't know how to do this. We don't have many of these here contraptions on the ship, but I think I will be able to do it in short order. Let me start this from the beginning here. Ahoy, ladies! I'll be Bosun Tubby. Day after tomorrow be the holiest day in the Pastafarian calendar. Talk like a pirate day. And on the, one of the best days of my life was talk, Arr! Arr, was a best talk like a pirate day in 2008. I've been a member of this air crew for years. And uh, I don't, usually don't make it to meetings because I'm usually at sea. But uh, on that day, the holiest day except Fridays of the Pastafarian year, the, the most confounded, filthy, dung-soled, barnacle-covered, bilge-slaking, sons of fish bait mobs of accursed lovers you ever saw descended on our fair city. Them pig-headed, slimy, verminous blackguards dared to defile our day with their pestilent presence. They was smug, thinking they could tell us where to go, but there was a humiliation to all decent gentlemen of fortune and their thick-headed, pig-headed, mangy, sniveling protest could not go unanswered. So here's what happened. The Westboro Baptist Church, uh, it, the Westboro Baptist Church came to Little Rock to protest the Editorial Writers Convention of America, and they chose, as I said, the holiest day of our year, while the, post while the Editorial Writers was here for a parley and to, for some skirt chasing, and we were outraged. So. What we done was this. They had a corner near the inn where they, the, the editorial writers be meeting, and we reserved the corner opposite them. We started out just like all we was doing is promoting talk like a pirate day, and then they showed up, and we changed our signs. <laughs> and our signs said, now a lot of people thought we were, they didn't know what we were, they thought we were Jimmy Buffett fans, some of them. <laughs> but... What we did, I mean, it was like this. We had talked like a pirate today, and then when they showed up, God hates cotton pasta polyester blends. Basically the same idea. So here they be, the scallywags, this confounded, filthy, dung soul, barnacle covered, bilge looking sons of fish bite. Uh, there's a picture of them. And here we are. We brought out these signs. We still had talked like a pirate day, of course, but. God hates shrimp, Leviticus. <laughs> and uh, God hates shrimp, cotton polyester blends, and well, the Phelps and the Westboro Baptist Church and all of the above. And you'll notice here we asked them to write about us instead. They were here seeking publicity and we was taking it from them. <laughs> uh, some others joined us, we didn't even know who they was and we didn't know they was gonna be coming, but we're thankful they came all the same. And so the Arkansas Times done wrote us up. Here's what they said. What do you do when a 
to make a bunch of soulless nutcases abandon their post at the convention center. Send in the pirates. <laughs> yep, the Cuckoo Phelps hate group walked the plank this morning after a happy bunch dressed like pirates and holding signs saying God hates shrimp, Leviticus, and God hates cotton polyester blends stood opposite them at the corner of Markham and Scott Street. The group, made up of central Arkansas pastafarians, waved swords and growled ar in a manner that would have made Abby Hoffman proud. <laughs> With cars honking and waving at the pirates and a TV crew giving them all the attention, the Phelps group, with a child in tow, sadly, picked up their fag epithets and went away. Pitiful. It was a proud day for us, and we didn't just get ripped up in Arkansas times. There was people from all over the, the country writing about us. Here was one, you know, where they, they said, proud day for Pastafarians. It was a victory for Pastafarians everywhere. And then... We had another headline pirates duel with Phelps family, and there's another picture of us. And then the Kansas City Pitch wrote, the pirates of Little Rock stole Fred Phelps Westboro Baptist Church Thunder last Friday. The Topeka Church was protesting the National Conference of Editorial Writers because they are responsible for the satanic milieu in this evil land and for assisting the satanic agendas of baby killers and fags. But a fortuitous twist, the protest happened to fall on international talk like a pirate day. One headline said, how to make Fred Phelps disappear. We was proud of that one. <laughs> Others got the idea as well. Um, there was a, pro, a counter protest, kind of Pastafarian counter protest in Vancouver, British Columbia. And there was another one, hooray for the pirates. And we got a lot. So remember, the day after tomorrow be international talk like a pirate day. The day when everyone will speak normally like I do. <laughs> And bear in mind, it's going to be a good day. It always is. And if those fish slow on a great fire ever come back here, we'll be ready for them again. Arr! 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 Oh, I almost done forgot to tell you who's coming up next. He knows all about piracy, and I'll tell you why. He is a physicist. I don't know what that is, but I think it means something important. He's at the University of Arkansas, a Little Rock professor at the physics department. He also, very important, knows how to make beer. <laughs> he uh, used to fly one of them flying ships, and he's been all over the world in that. His name's John Anglin, and he is going to be here to tell you a little bit more about us pirates. Thank you. Thank you, Bosun. So, uh, yeah, as uh, he said, I'm a, I'm a physicist. <laughs> uh, so, of course, I know everything there's to know about pirates. Uh, I uh, went to the uh, University of YouTube to find a lot of information here. Uh, but I do, uh, I do a lot of research as a physicist. And so the idea of researching piracy was kind of interesting to me. And so I thought about talking a little bit about things like, you know, how the pirates are associated with free thought. But I thought I came across the idea that the word, the definition of pirate has changed, you know, over the last five, six hundred years or so. So I kind of got to researching that and looking into how we get from the early days of piracy to modern, like, computer piracy kind of thing. So the first recorded instances of piracy go back to about the 15th century BC. So thousands and thousands of years. These were uh, a people that, a lot of history texts just called them the sea people. Uh, and I'm not entirely certain uh, where they came from, but they operated out in the Aegean Sea and tended to prey on Greek shipping vessels. The idea of piracy is really kind of grows out of uh, the class system of people being very poor and subservient to the very rich, this kind of Robin Hood sort of idea of robbed from the rich, uh, except that most pirates didn't give to the poor, they themselves were the poor, so they decided to make themselves rich. Now, how do you become rich as a pirate? Well, you find a place 
where goods are being moved in high volume, and you steal those, and then you resell them. So this happens more and more often, especially as we move into uh, the age of sale and global commerce. You start to see trade between Europe and the New World. So 15th century, thereabouts, uh, you kind of start to see this golden age of sale. And you start to see activities of a lot of guys like Blackbeard, for example, would, uh, would kind of abduct these large Spanish galleons. The Spanish were the source of a lot of the wealth in Europe at the time. And they would move large portions of not just gold, but things like spices, uh, you know, different food stuff, things, linens, things to trade, they were all very valuable. So the pirates would accost these guys on the seas, take over their ship, move as much cargo as they could, and then go to another port and sell it very quickly. As a result, there are very, very few recorded instances of pirates actually burying treasure. One of the only ones that I could find was uh, Captain Kidd at one point, I don't recall the date off the top of my head, had conducted a raid on, it was a, uh, a donkey train Somewhere it's a bunch of donkeys and they're pulling wagons and a train of lots of different valuables. And his crew accosts these guys, but there's only a few of them. So they take the product and they take the good off of this train and they bury it for a day or two. But they post guards so nobody can come get it. And then very quickly dig it up bring in some more wagons, load it up, move it out, go sell it. If you are a pirate and you're trying to make money off of the theft of other people's property, why would you ever want to bury it? There would be no reason for that. Even if you had a large amount of treasure, generally the large amounts of treasure came with its very own boat. So why wouldn't you just take the boat? Uh, now, interestingly, piracy does not evolve into kind of what we think of today when we think of pirates until uh, a novelist in the 1800s called Robert Louis Stevenson writes a self publishes a little book called Treasure Island that nobody's read. Uh, and Treasure Island has the, is kind of the first representation of pirates as the, the peg leg, eye patch wearing uh, parrot kind of guy. Now this starts an idea, a romanticism of the life of a pirate. Now at the time, sea travel, especially international, is still very, very big, still very lucrative. Uh, naval service, was a big deal. We have the War of 1812, we were leading up to World War I. So there's lots and lots of naval traffic. There's lots of military navies out there. A lot of young men would join the Navy in Spain and England. But the thing with naval life in the 18th and 19th century is it wasn't a lot of fun. Uh, in fact, it was hard work. It was very grueling. You would be at sea for weeks, for months. Uh, many times you would get lost. It was very dangerous. You, you didn't have navigation equipment like we do now. We had sextants, which worked quite well. But you couldn't forecast weather, so you would have storms. You would encounter harsh living conditions. Can't shower, obviously, you're on this wooden ship. And you had to follow a strict chain of command. So perhaps the captain didn't like you, you didn't like the captain. Your life would really suck. 
So this romanticized idea of, wow, wouldn't it be cool to be one of those pirate guys? Man, you could just have your own ship. You don't have to listen to anybody. You can kind of go out on your own. And, you know, no rules. Drink whenever you want. Chase women. You know, that would be great. Of course, no, you know, nobody does this. This is fantasy. But it kind of leads into this romanticized vision. So much that in the 1960s, uh, the Walt Disney Company makes an animated film about treasure island and pirates. And this really kind of cements this in popular culture. Even today, I've seen a lot of things where Disney is doing uh, the kind of pirate character uh, to market to little kids that this is just kind of this fun thing. Uh, I mean, how many pirate costumes do you see at Halloween? And we did Pirates of the Caribbean, a great ride at the Disney parks. They made a really fun movie about it a few years ago. And then some not so fun sequels to the same movie. <laughs> so you get this kind of idea of the romanticized pirate. I saw something doing this research that really was kind of unintentionally funny, I think, to me. Disney had something they were doing. It was part of some promotional material for, I don't know, Mickey Mouse Club or one of these little kid shows. And it had some children characters, cartoon characters, dressed as pirates. And I guess they were trying to teach about good behavior or something. And it said, a good pirate never takes anyone else's property. And I thought, I don't think Disney knows what pirates are anymore. <laughs> well, this idea, around the 60s, 70s, starts to kind of die down in popular culture. But you have a new form of piracy. You get radio piracy. You get pirate radio. Now, pirate radio grows out of the rebellious rock and roll era when we're transitioning from the 1940s big band into this kind of, you know, really scandalous, dirty Elvis Presley gyrating his hips. And so you would want to get that kind of music out there. But there are so many regulations, the FCC and such, that you'd have to get around, censorship, all kind of things. So you would make a pirate radio station. You didn't register it with the FCC. You set up a tower, you started broadcasting. Or you would find a frequency in the radio band that was not being used and piggyback on that. Pirate radio is also used as propaganda. Uh, we would use it in wartime, Korea, Vietnam. We would broadcast over the radio waves and tell the resistance, hey guys, keep fighting. Uh, in places like communist China, North Korea, you still have pirate radio stations that are broadcasting propaganda, that are both for and against the government. I read an interesting thing the other day. There is an interesting use of pirate radio today. There is a constellation of communication satellites that was launched in the mid-60s to early 70s. They were nothing more than radio relays. They're just repeaters. They're still in orbit. They still have power, you can still bounce signals off of them. But they're totally useless for any kind of real military operation or anything. They're completely unencrypted, very low power. But what you do have are drug cartels and human trafficking that come across the border from Mexico, for example, will bounce their signals off of these satellites to talk to each other. There is an organization out there of guys like semi-trailer drivers, truckers, who will intercept these signals and coordinate with the FBI, local law enforcement, to go, hey, these guys are talking on their little back satellite channel, on their pirate radio channels, let's go get them. Very much like scam bait. Piracy continues this way, this electronic idea of stealing signals. And it kind of morphs in the modern era into uh, computer piracy. The idea of here's some software that 
I don't want to pay hundreds and hundreds of dollars for a license. So I'm just going to take it. Now, of course, it's much, much harder to go down to the local Best Buy or Circuit City or whatever you had in the day and physically pick up a copy of the software and walk out the door. That's called stealing. Uh, and they generally don't like that. So here come the modern day pirates. Well, I don't have to steal the physical property anymore. Now I just have to steal that series of ones and zeros. Early days of computing, there's no copy protection. I buy a piece of software, I mean, I can stick it in my hard drive, I can make copies of it, I can make copy and give it to everybody in this room, nothing stops me. That's piracy. Uh, they keep cracking down on this. To this day, piracy uh, is a big problem in the entertainment industry, the software industry. Every time you go watch a movie on DVD or on a streaming service, there's always the big warning about, hey, don't steal this. Don't put this up for public viewing. And I know that's there because when I download the episodes of things like The Mandalorian uh, on my computer from sites like the Pirate Bay, uh, those things are, <laughs> are attached there. You're not going to be able to stop it. But this kind of idea of, you know, I'm a pirate. I'm going to go take what is not mine from the rich. They're hoarding the good software. Apple, Adobe, for example, Adobe makes uh, uh, blah, 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 Premiere. Premiere, Acrobat. Very, very expensive pieces of software to do something that pretty much everybody needs to do. So let's go download that. The this <coughs> church of the flying spaghetti monster, the idea of the pirate costume being the way that you honor the uh, flying spaghetti monster. This is kind of tied to that whole idea. It's tied to that idea of, hey, the churches own this kind of airspace of delivering their message. We're going to take that from them. We're going to take that over. We're going to piggyback on that. And we're going to be pirates. Now, what the next evolution of piracy is, who knows? But it's still going to be there. It's still going to exist. It's just going to change form. So I'm here today to tell you that, in the words of Jimmy Buffett, yes, I am a pirate. 200 years too late. Because, you see, I use things like Pirate Bay. <laughs> I swap software with my friends. I have been known on occasion when flying to tune into radio stations that we didn't necessarily pay for. I think we're all pirates, in a way. The trick is, as Disney says, just be a good pirate and don't take other people's property. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. 
second Sunday Cantina Communion. Uh, uh, Bert, uh, we're having one on the fourth, I believe, as well. The fourth Sunday, is that correct? I don't know. Okay. Well, look it up. Go to um, Chris. What's our meetup website? Our meetup. Meetup.com forward slash AR Freethinkers. Meetup.com slash forward slash AR Freethinkers. And you'll see our whole calendar of events. Um, we're trying to get more things like that. Um, we'd love to do, I mean, I would love to have another, well, I mean, I'd hate to invite us for our Baptist back to Little Rock or never. But it would just be great if you, if you hear of something like that going on in your community that needs somebody to come and make a counter protest. Um, uh, if you hear of something going on, it's happening, it seems like, daily in, in this area. There's one thing or another. Um, if it's not sections about trying to trash FOIA uh, in the government, uh, which happened this last week, it's, it's something else. So um, we are trying our best. So let us know, get us involved, send somebody a message, and we'll try to show up for you guys uh, and for to, to help in some way that we can. Just like that would be a hoot. I love that that's something that's in ASF's history. Uh, tongue in cheek aside, that was really something that uh, we did, um, the group did, I wasn't there at the time, but I think was really important. And we got national news off of it, and we actually got to take some of the uh, steam and fire, piss and vinegar right out of those Westboro people, and uh, tell them that, you know, maybe their voice is not going to be the loudest one we give a day. So I appreciate that that is in our heritage. So anyway, thanks so much for coming this, this month. We'll have another one, same time uh, next month in October. Um, Free Thinkers, check us out online at arfreethinkers.org. You can also find us on Meetup, Facebook, and on YouTube. At Arkansas Society of Free Thinkers, people are accepted as human beings and are never threatened with eternal damnation. In a nutshell, a free thinker believes there are no imaginary gods whose dogmas is sent to control the human race. Rather, we are all human beings responsible for our own actions and our own future. Check us out at any of the following online locations. Send us an email and let's talk. Or go to Meetup and join us at any of our regularly scheduled events. Let's get together and hope to see you soon. If you'd like to know more about the Arkansas Society of Freethinkers, check us out online at arfreethinkers.org. You can also find us on Meetup, Facebook, and on YouTube. At Arkansas Society of Freethinkers, people are accepted as human beings and are never threatened with eternal damnation. In a nutshell, a freethinker believes there are no imaginary gods whose dogma is sent to control the human race. Rather, we are all human beings responsible for our own actions and our own future. Check us out at any of the following online locations. Send us an email and let's talk. Or go to Meetup and join us at any of our regularly scheduled events. Let's get together and hope to see you soon. If you'd like to know more about the Arkansas Society of Freethinkers,